Okay, so that this morning was the easy stuff. We're going to move to the real stuff now. No, no, <laughs> no, no. But, uh, well, so so we're going to be talking now uh, about structural variant calling. Uh, maybe just given some of the questions that I got during the break, I'll, I'll just make a couple of comments on on this morning. So most of what I talked about was um, assuming that we were doing variant calling on the normal human genome. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that, that, that many of you actually are, are thinking of doing variant calling in different contexts, other, other organism, mixed population, and things like that. So there, many of the steps are the same, but the variant calling itself is going to be different because the expectation that you're getting 0%, 50%, or 100% no longer apply if you're sequencing a mixture of population and things like that. So. Um, that's, so that's something to, to, to keep in mind. So again, you can also do variant calling in this uh, context, but, um, but then you have to use the variant caller or, or tell the variant caller that you're not expecting this diploid genome, which is basically uh, the parameters that we were using in, in the lab before. So you can do it, there's no question, but it's just the variant calling part itself would be slightly, uh, slightly different. Uh, so, so, so we talked about structural uh, small variant calling uh, indels, but very small indels. Now we're going to be moving to uh, structural variant calling. So these are going to be larger events. Um, so the objective, uh, and again, I mean, most of what I'll say uh, is it's going to be uh, using the human genome as a reference, um, although similar principle also apply if you're doing, using a different reference. So the, the learning objectives for this module is to understand and know what structural variants are, uh, to, un to, to appreciate how you can discover uh, structural variants from next generation sequencing data, uh, to appreciate the strengths and weaknesses. You'll see that uh, in the case of the first module, I really went over a pretty well-established uh, pipeline, which is this GATK framework. For structural variants, uh, you'll see that there's really still, it's still work in progress, and there's lots of different tools, and, and, and we're only going to be using one, but I'll at least try to, to give you a sense of the types of tools that are available. Um, and, then, uh, and then in the practical, uh, as I said, we'll be using one tool, in particular, and we'll start and we'll visually explore some of these uh, structural variants. Um, so, what what are structural variants? So, structural variants uh, are defined as, as genomic rearrangement that affect some bigger size of sequence. Uh, the, the actual cutoff, you know, changes as things evolve. So, but keep in mind, it's, it's typically affecting. Uh, you know, bigger pieces of, of DNA, so above 50 base pair or 100 or, or bigger than the KB. So these are bigger events. Uh, so you can have deletion, novel insertions, inversion uh, rearrangements, mobile element transposition, so insertion of, of transposable element, duplication, translocation. So this is, so we're putting into this, cat, this, this broad category any uh, any uh, DNA change that affects a, a big, big uh, portion of the genome. Um, so, I mean, again, especially so historically, uh, so it's been known that there's these larger events that are happening that are affecting a uh, chromosome. Um, you can even, uh, it's such a, some of these events can be large enough that you can actually uh, visualize them and see them. Uh, you have some examples of that uh, here. Um, in cancer in particular, uh, so this is a, a sky image of a, of a cancer cell line. Uh, so in this type of representation, you would expect every normal uh, human chromosome to, paint, to be painted in a, in a given color. And what you see here, the fact that the colors are all you know, mixed up is that um, there's been lots of rearrangements. So you know, whole chromosome duplication, translocation, all of these larger events are, are um, structural variants. So, uh, I mean, 
historically, again, this was, was very well known, but uh, the resolution uh, that, that we had, the tools didn't really um, allow to identify the specific breakpoints and the specific uh, change that were happening. Uh, so, so now with next generation sequencing, there's the potential to really sort of refine. I mean, it was a lot of work to really identify the specific breakpoints um, from these high level maps. Uh, but now the hope is that with next generation sequencing, we should be able to really zoom in onto those breakpoints. And in the context of cancer, finding uh, recurrent aberrations and so on. <clears throat> um, so, so just a bit more on the different type of structural variants. Um, so, because this is really, I guess, you'll see the tools that we're going to be talking about target different different uh, types of structural variants. Uh, so you've got uh, some structural variant called CNVs, copy number variants, and looking at deletion, duplication. So this is changing the number of copy of that region in the <laughs> genome. Copy neutral rearrangements, so inversion, that doesn't change the amount of DNA or the number of copies. Translocation, same thing. Uh, and then some of these other uh, structural variants that are sort of a mix of both. Um, so novel insertions, uh, so, so the, you know, foreign DNA insertion, mobile element transposition, and so on. Um, so a visual representation of these now. <clears throat> so and how can we, well, so this is sort of, yeah, it's a visual representation of all of this. So deletion, so you've got the reference genome. So we're going to be seeing lots of these types of plots. So uh, a reference genome, if you have a deletion, uh, obviously you're losing a piece of DNA, novel insertion, mobile element looks quite similar. So the genome that you're sequencing actually has, has this extra DNA here. Uh, tandem duplication, interspersed duplication, uh, an inversion that would just simply reverse uh, the strand of a particular piece of DNA and a translocation, which, uh, which is here. Um, so I'm sort of going through this quite, quite quickly, but I, I'm sure you're, most of you are familiar with this. Uh, so again, as I was saying, a lot of, so it's been known for a very long time that, that structural variants are important. It's important in cancer. It's also important in a number of genetic disorders. Uh, but it, it, and it used to be that it was really sort of coarse grain view of this, and it was actually quite hard to, to, to know specifically what the rearrangements were. Uh, new technologies such, that, uh, such as CGH and, and, and Sky, that in some of the images I was showing, you know, allowed sort of finer resolution of what these rearrangements were. Um, <clears throat> the, the microarrays were used quite extensively, especially uh, to detect copy number, and that's what I'll, I'll show now. Um, but then with next generation sequencing, and that's going to be our module, in theory, we'll, we'll really be able to do a, a much, much better job at, at detecting these structural variants. Um, so, so before we go to the next generation sequencing, uh, again, a lot of work uh, was done especially to detect uh, copy number variation using uh, microarrays. Uh, because whether it's, it's an array CGH or it's a SNP array, um, you can really, you know, by hybridizing different sample, observe that you have extra copies uh, because you get more intensity on specific probes uh, for different regions. So you're, you're able to say, you know, yeah, using both platform, you know, there's extra copies of DNA or there's no copies, there's loss, uh, and, and be able to say um, quite a bit about heterozygosity as well uh, from the SNP array, for instance. Uh, so I won't, I won't cover any of that uh, since it's not the, the topic, but, but again, there's, there's definitely alternative technologies to look at uh, copy number variation uh, quite effectively for the most part. And then we've learned quite a bit about the importance and the, the, how common CNVs are from uh, all of these array-based uh, technologies. Uh, the, the, the good thing with next generation sequencing, though, is that uh, in theory, it's not just going to be the copy number variant 
that we'll be able to pick up. We'll be able to pick up uh, all types of structural variants. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that we were doing in the first module where these are reads, right, paired end reads that are mapped to the reference genome. And then from just looking at, at whether the, the reads match the reference, we're able to call these SNPs. We're also able to call the small indels. So this, um, we've, we've done that already. Uh, similarly for now copy number, if we don't see any reads from a particular region in the genome, we'll be able to infer that, that this was deleted or partially deleted. Or if we see more reads uh, than we would expect by chance, well, we can, we can expect that this is a gain of DNA. Uh, more than that, um, you know, if you have that one end of the read maps to one chromosome, the other end maps to the translocation, no, to a different chromosome, you'll be able to say that there's a translocation. So again, the, <clears throat> there's no question that, um, so the potential in theory, we can really do all of that. In practice, um, it, it's really the interpretation of uh, the read and, and, and converting that into structural variant calls um, turns out to be, uh, I mean, doable, but, but still challenging. Um, so, so I'll go, so there's different, different strategies. So it's a different way of, because in particular, you know, if you think these, the reads that we were looking at, these are the reads that basically map very well to the genome, for instance. Uh, so a criteria for calling a variant like this was that the read mapped to the genome at that position. And then you, we looked at the quality of the base and then we were able to say there's, uh, there's a variant. These reads don't map on the reference genome the way you would expect. So you have to, to do a little bit more effort at the mapping step uh, and at the interpretation step to, to pick up these types of events. So I'm breaking up uh, the, so how do we use this, the next generation sequencing read information to call SVs? So there's different strategies and I, I, I'm, I'm putting them there's basically four broad strategies to use this. So one is to use this read pair information. Um, so you, so a lot of the, the reads are, are read as, as a pair. Um, and, and from how the two ends of the read map, we'll be able to uh, detect structural variants. So I'll go over that. So that's one strategy. Another strategy is to use this concept of, of read depth. So this is going to help us detect the copy number, um, so just the amount of reads in a given region. Uh, another trickier one, I guess, but also a source of information is, is if one read maps correctly, but the other read uh, basically only maps part partial. Uh, so this is called a split read, where one read doesn't fully map, it maps and then doesn't map anymore. Uh, so we'll be able to use these patterns which we call split reads, to refine exactly where the breakpoint is. And then finally, there's a, this broad category of, well, I'll get to that, but assembly. So forget about the reference genome. Just looking at the reads themselves, um, can, we, uh, can we detect structural variant? Can we assemble the genome that, we're refer that we've sequenced? So I'll go over these uh, different categories and talk a little bit about the tools. So the first broad category or broad strategy to call uh, structural variants is to look at the, the information of the read pairs. <clears throat> so, so typically, um, when, the, when you're sequencing uh, fragments, you, there's a distribution of fragment length that you expect, such that when you map your reads back to the reference genome, you know the expected distance between the two reads based on the fragment length distribution. Uh, this is an example of, a, of a, some type of a mate pair library where the, the, the distance between the, begin, the, the read one and read two is, is normal around 10 kb. Uh, so you, so the, the fragment, DNA fragment that you sequence, of which you've sequenced the beginning and the end, you expect them to be roughly 10 kb. So any read that where the two ends map in a way that's discordant, big, much bigger than 10 kb, 
are much smaller are suspicious. Um, so this is uh, what we call these discordant weeds, and we'll use them to, to detect structural variants. So another way of looking at this, a sort of a cartoon way. Um, so the, the, the genome that we're sequencing is on top and the reference genome is at the bottom. And again, we expect, we, we know what we fed into the machine, which was fragments that are roughly 10 kb or, 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 or shorter for the most part, and, you know, typically a few hundred base pair for fragments for, uh, for Illumina reads. So if after mapping on the reference genome, we get that they're roughly 10 kb, we'll, we'll say this is fine. But anytime we get something like this, where the read one and read two are too far apart, uh, this is gonna correspond to potentially um, a deletion. So, I mean, your reads, sorry, I'm up here. So they are 10 kb apart or, or let's say 10 kb, they are 10 kb apart, but when you map them on the reference genome, they look like they're 15 kb apart. So that's because there's something that's missing uh, from the reference genome. Uh, similarly, if it's too small uh, on the reference genome, this is also suspicious. Uh, so this might be um, an insertion. So similarly, so this is re re using only the information about distance between read one and read two. You can also use information about, there's an expected orientation. Uh, so on the genome, the reads should be, you know, should be facing each other. Uh, if, if once you map them on the reference genome, they don't face each other in, in, in the order expected, again, this is an indication that there's been the rearrangement. Um, <clears throat> but you, maybe you start seeing how this is getting a little bit more complicated because you've got all sorts of special cases but basically, anytime you see reads that don't map on the reference genome the way you expect, you can sort of convert that back into a, a structural variant. <clears throat> so you've got lots and lots of different case. Um, the, in the context for an inversion, for instance, if there's an inversion, uh, so this was inverted, you expect actually one abnormal uh, read uh, over this breakpoint. So this one is abnormal, and you also expect another one uh, over the second. So an inversion would actually be a pair of, of unusual reads in this case. Um, so all of these, again, are these are the what we call discordant uh, reads, um, and this is for a distant inversion. So th the idea, just like uh, we did with a small variant, is that you want to aggregate information for multiple reads that are supporting one of these events. Uh, so there's <clears throat> a number of tools that do this um, in different way. Uh, Breakdancer was one of the first uh, popular tool uh, doing that. Uh, the, the one that we're going to be uh, using in, in, the, um, in the practical is called Lumpy. Uh, but again, all of these tools, what they do is that they look in the mapping files at the, the reads that didn't map the way they should uh, and look for uh, evidence, multiple reads supporting the same event and then provide a list of, of events. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm putting now an example um, of, of, of a project that I was part of where we were start doing this um, just to illustrate, but this is quite some time ago already. Um, well, well, one point uh, that's well, it's small and hard to see here, but again, just from looking at, looking for these discordant reads and, and, and clusters of cluster read, we're able to actually detect uh, places where there are deletions, where there's tandem duplication, uh, and, and all sorts of different events. So multiple reads uh, supporting the fact that there's, there's a problem. And but we'll, we'll go over that uh, in the practical and, and see some examples of how, how that's done. Uh, so this was from, from the same study, but this shows that compared to array CGH that would just basically tell you where, um, where you have copy number change, where you have gains. So this is these plots on top 
Now you're also getting information, which is down here, kind of messy, but so this is information saying, well, you know, I have not, all the way down here, this was, I have a thousand read that start at this position and end at this position. So this suggests that in the tumor, this is probably now really the breakpoint and next to that a particular piece of DNA. So you have much more finer uh, information about specific breakpoints and, and, and where the things are. Um, so I, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, I just wanted to highlight, uh, again, there's multiple me methods that, that do this, and but the, let's just say that the, um, uh, it is a more challenging problem than than small um, uh, the, the small variant calling. Uh, if you have repetitive regions, you're going to get in trouble because here we're using reads that are not mapped exactly where you know the, you think they are. So if 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 you're in repetitive regions, you might actually be misplacing some of these reads. So that's going to be a challenge. Uh, if you have multiple breakpoints or multiple rearrangements within the region, this is also going to create some very complicated um, abnormal read pairs, and so so that's also going to be uh, quite challenging. Uh, so so most methods still have quite a high rate of false positives. So if you look compared to the var small variant call, we were getting a list. Most of them we could easily filter. Uh, most of these methods still make a lot of of calls that are that are false positive. Uh, the strengths of, of, of approaches of this type is that, in principle, you can detect really with these abnormal reads almost any class of, of structural variant. Um, so this this is using information about read pairs, um, right? How how wh whether both ends are mapping where they expect. Uh, Maybe a slightly easier approach is or the read depth approach. Um, this is much more similar to what's done for copy number variants uh, using arrays. Um, so here's an example where it sort of jumps out uh, quite clearly. Uh, you've got a normal sample. This is showing you the coverage. And you have a tumor sample. And, and clearly, there's many more reads that are mapped into this region. Um, but given that you know, the, the DNA was all sheared at the same time. The interpretation for this is that there's multiple copy in the genome somewhere um, of that particular uh, piece of DNA. Um, so so the, most of the approaches, um, again, you know, you're basically counting reads and, and windows. Um, but the tricky part comes with the normalization and, and, and different things that end up af affecting this coverage. And if you have a targeted assay, that's going to be even more problematic than a whole genome uh, approach. But basically, you're looking at read density and then, and then using that to call. Um, you know, it's, uh, the strengths of these read depth approaches is that it's, it's fast and relatively simple. Um, it's easy to identify gene you know, amplification. Um, Again, it's, it, it's relatively easy to validate with, with other approach, like CNV approaches. Uh, the, the, the weakness and the challenges is that there, it's not clear exactly what is the, the resolution of this. And so the bin size, how do you select the appropriate bin size? Um, so the, the actual boundaries of the events are not necessarily um, super well characterized. And then you cannot detect balance events. So if there's an inversion, or if there's, you know, you won't you won't be able to tell. Also, if there's a duplication, where is that duplication? Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, I well, this is like a, I'm using this opportunity as a a plug for one of the tools that we're working on, actually. Um, so, ideally, what you would expect is that the coverage is more or less uniform. And then you suddenly have a jump uh, in coverage. Uh, the problem is that in reality, coverage, if you, even if you do whole genome sequencing, coverage looks like this, even when, when you have normal two copy. Uh, and that's because of issues like GC content and, and, and the fact that in some case, um, the shearing itself is going to you know, lead to some bias in terms of coverage. So this is really what the, the coverage looks like. Um, 
So, so the approach that we've been working on, uh, actually the strategy that we use is that we look at many samples at the same time, where uh, if you look in green, what this is showing is the distribution of coverage of many samples. So this is 100 samples. So you see that the coverage of all of these tends to go up and down, but it's the same regions. It's the same for everybody that this region is easier to sequence and for which you get more reads. So by looking at this distribution across lots of samples, then we can, when we look at one sample, we can easily see whether we're falling within that distribution or outside of that distribution and that we can call uh, variance. Um, we can call copy number uh, from this more effectively than, than when we're only looking at one sample and trying to do it like this uh, horizontally. Anyway, but so, so this is just, I mean, I, I'm showing this in particular also to just say that this is still an area of active development. There's not just one tool that does this. So there's many tools that, that do this type of read depth strategy to be able to call copy number. But this is still uh, very much an active development, both for read depth and, and the other tools. So, uh, so we won't directly uh, cover this, uh, even though with the tool Lumpy that we'll use, we'll get some, some evidence of deletion. And, but it's not relying on read depth directly. Uh, <clears throat> so a summary of read depth. So read depth tools, so weakness. So relatively low resolution, so it's not clear exactly what size of bins to use to be robust, but, um, you know, normally it's, it's um, you know, it's reasonable size bins, so something maybe of the order of 10 KB. Uh, you're missing some rearrangements because if there's no change in copy number, you won't find it. Um, and, but the strength is that, I guess, you, you do determine directly from that how many DNA copy number you have. Um, and, you know, it works relatively well even if you have uh, lower coverage. Uh, the other approach will require typically more coverage to, to work. Um, okay, so moving on, um, moving on to, to the, the, the next set of strategies we can use, right? So we've used uh, abnormal pairs, we've used this, this depth of coverage. Um, the other strategy is, is the reads that themselves um, are not mapped well on the genome. So it's not the location of the two pairs, it's the read itself that you know, doesn't find its place in the genome potentially because it's over a breakpoint. Um, so this is, well, and this slide is not so great, so it's hard to see from this. Um, but this, again, goes back to the mapping step. So in the mapping step, uh, there's going to be a way to interpret reads that have exactly this, this profile, where only, so the read needs to be long enough. But if, if the read is 100 base pair, and only the first 60 base match perfectly and then gets clipped and then you know the, the remaining 40 base don't map at that location um, this is evidence of, of a breakpoint potentially so so various tool including uh, lumpy that we're going to use are going to again scan through your bam and make and pull out those reads um, to say well this these reads are supporting uh, a breakpoint at this position, if that makes sense. Um, so, what, I mean, well, I have it here, I guess. So, this does require sufficient coverage because you need, again, to have hopefully reads that cover the breakpoints. Um, there's, again, this problem that in repetitive regions you're going to have ambiguous mapping, and so this might get a little bit tricky. Um, Strengths are that it really sort of goes hand in hand with the read pair methods because it's, it's really the same principles apply as the read pairs, but now you're looking for the break to be happening within the read itself. And so it's one of the other strength is that it's really, you get basically, you can basically see the breakpoint in your read, right? So the breakpoint, it cuts somewhere in your read. So you get a base pair resolution of your breakpoints, which is, which is quite nice. Um, okay, so hopefully you're still with me. So the last, uh, the last strategy, uh, 
to, to identify structural variants from, from NGS data is assembly. Uh, so assembly uh, is really ultimately, I mean, it's very appealing because uh, in theory, why, you know, you're sequencing a genome uh, that maybe is different from the reference, so why map to the reference and then look for differences and things like that? In theory, you can take all the reads that you have and assemble the genome from scratch, and then you would see all of that. In practice, uh, that's really hard. So taking all the reads and assembling them into a good quality genome is really challenging. Uh, and you tend to make more mistakes than correct guess. So uh, it's good for certain things, but again, you're also going to have false positive because if you make a mistake in trying to assemble, well, first of all, it's, it takes a lot of computational resources because aligning reads on the genome is relatively easy compared to you know, if I give you 500 million reads, it's a puzzle with 500 million pieces. You know, it's, it's not an easy puzzle. Uh, so, but, but again, uh, there are, you know, for reads, for instance, that don't map on the genome, you might take all of those reads, assemble them, or try to put them, you know, see similarities. So you can directly from looking at the reads look for these structural uh, events as well. Uh, the advantage here is that if it's foreign DNA, for instance, or something like that, you would also be able to recover. But, uh, but again, so this, you know, this is, I think, work in progress. Uh, there's a number of groups that are working on, on efficient methods that would directly from the unaligned reads before the mapping, looking for evidence of structural variance. Um, so there's, I'm putting here a few tools. Um, and but this again, so I mean, he, whoops. here the, the weakness is that it's computationally very intensive. Um, people are trying to speed this up, but it's really hard to, to assemble genomes, uh, especially if you're doing this something the size of the human genome. Um, it's quite hard to resolve patterns in repetitive regions. So, I mean, these are always hard to assemble well, so it's, it doesn't necessarily uh, solve all the problems that we had before. But the strengths is that, I mean, if we could solve this problem well, then we would have for sure base pair resolution of all breakpoints. We could find all the class of variation. Ultimately, that hopefully we'll find a way, but with, with short reads, it's hard to assemble a genome de novo. It's quite, uh, quite a challenge. Um, so, um, again, this, I think it, it's important to, to, to know that I, I think this is a, it's a hard, hard problem computationally. So a summary of the strategies uh, that, can, uh, that can be used to call structural variants. Um, so uh, here they've been ordered from, from low to high resolution. So how close uh, to breakpoint resolution do you have? And from low to high in terms of difficulty. So I talked about the depth of coverage method. So these are the easiest method. They give you copy number, <coughs> but you don't you don't have the exact breakpoints uh, because of these this whatever binning strategy that you're using, um, and you only get copy number gains or loss, but you don't know where those are in the genome. Uh, the paired end and the split read kind of go together, with the split read bringing you even closer to the breakpoints, um, and then um, and then ultimately you you in theory have the de novo assembly, but this is it's hot and you know it's so perfect resolution at some level, but it's, it's quite challenging. And it's especially, it's not just that it's challenging, it's that it's, it makes a mistake as well. You know, so having a perfect assembly using short reads is, is very difficult. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, from all of this, I don't want to leave you too discouraged, but uh, I wanted to show you what people tend to do. Uh, so I think state of the art for structural variants calling is actually to use many methods. Um, so people, so these are example from a thousand genome project and, and one of the recent uh, population sequencing project as well. <clears throat> and what people do is that they typically apply many tools, uh, many tools that use different source of information from read pair to read depth. So they use many tools in parallel and then they look for sort of evidence that this is a variant by multiple tools or different approaches, right? So that's a way of enriching for 
a true calls is that if you see it independently from two different tools, that's you know a good indication that it's working. Um, so both both method both approach really you know they use ten algorithms or something like that, and then they they looked at the calls that were common, and then they they went on and, and do you know do a lot of validation. So again, so it's working, and it's it's a great hypothesis generator, but it's still um, you know, there's no perfect tool that I'm aware of that, that can call all of them uh, uh, and that's, that gets it right uh, all the time. <clears throat> so, um, but I think, so, 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 so that, that's really, that was the, I wanted to, to set the stage. What we're actually going to be doing um, <clears throat> is, is look at some calls and look at, so, so these are the types of things that you would expect to see. And again, I mean, I look at, I show you this, and then you're like, you're probably going to say, well, this looks easy. I mean, how come there's no tool that can actually pull these out? Uh, so again, the tools do pull them out, but they just also pull a lot of things that are not real. So it's like, there's a lot of false positives in these. But I mean, there's definitely some 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 real, uh, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's not working. It's just that it, there's high rates of false positives. So this is an example where you see you get, you have reads everywhere. Uh, you have no reads in this region, and on top of that, you've got a lot of read pairs that ha don't have the expected distance, that are too far apart. So this is very good evidence for a deletion. Um, here's another one. So this is very good evidence of a duplication. You see that the read depth goes up, so you have more reads in this region. And on top of that, you've got all of these read pairs um, that are... Um, well, the wrong orientation in this case, uh, and wrong distance. So this is evidence for duplication. Uh, inversion, I talked about the fact that you actually expect abnormal reads. So you don't expect a change in coverage, but you, 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 expect, um, you expect abnormal reads um, you know, on the two breakpoints, on the two sides of the inversion. So that's what we see here. Um, so we're going to do, in the, in the lab, we're going to look at IGV and look at how we can color things to, to see these types of patterns. But it's the same principle as with a small variant calling. I mean, you're going to see a lot of regions where there's weird reads, but what we're looking for are lots of weird reads that are saying the same thing, <laughs> right? So it's, it's pulling out, and that's what this, the, the various algorithms are going to be pulling out of the data is consistent co consistently weird reads um, and and finally here's a an example of an, uh, an ex uh, insertion of a transposable element um, so I mean especially <clears throat> it was true before but it's even more true for the structural variants after we've run the pipeline uh, where you're going to have prediction, it's, it's quite useful to look at some of the example to see what type of support the reads have for that particular event and sort of learn what types of patterns to expect given the different types of events. So deletion, I mean, again, the, the read depth is a pretty, it's a pretty obvious one. And then the patterns of, of abnormal reads, that's slightly, slightly trickier to interpret. Um, Another another thing, and we won't cover that in the lab. But another thing is, um, is you know, you can make beautiful picture if you make if you call structural variance because you can. So this circles plot is is one way to represent uh, sort of an overview of all of the structural variance that you would have in your data set because it's it's a representation where you have all the chromosomes and then you're showing that this is next to that. So, but this we we won't cover. But uh, you know, if you call the structural variant, you can make nice figures. So that was the message of this slide. <laughs> um, okay, so with that, I think we'll we'll try to call uh, some structural variants uh, in in our data set.